Hey folks, for today's 10 minute book talk, I'm Brenton Dickinson and I want to talk to you about Out of the Sign of the Planet. That's right, C.S. Lewis's early SF fiction, Out of the Sign of the Planet, which I also have here in my uh, terribly kind of broken down, but kind of super cool, old, ugly SF design, Out of the Sign of the Planet. All right, this book has kind of a cool history because C.S. Lewis is not known for writing science fiction, though he did attempt it through uh, about an eight year period, about World War II period. He actually, of course, is known as the Narnian. He's done all this other kind of stuff. But this is actually a really neat book. Out of the Silent Planet is on the list of some of the best 20th century science fiction uh, and number 80 on the list that I use as I'm checking off my SF reading. And it was really his first attempt at giving us uh, a kind of public or popular fiction. In the 1920s, he had done an epic poem called Dimer. Uh, it didn't sell well. I quite like the poem, but it's pretty weird and it didn't really work very well as popular fiction. And in the early 1930s, he tried to tell his conversion story using an allegory very much like A Pilgrim's Progress. And the result was what you might expect. So not really popular fiction, but just a, a book that was read by a few that captures a certain element of life. In this book, though, it's quite different. It really is just popular fiction. It really is science fiction in a certain kind of vein. And it came out of a propitious moment. C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien are hanging around in the mid-30s. T Tolkien has not yet published The Hobbit, although he's written it, and so he certainly has gone on to be Lord of the Rings fame kind of person. I mean, he will ultimately become the person that forges the way for a recreation of fantasy literature in a certain vein, particularly high fantasy. C.S. Lewis is not the Narnian and won't be for another 15 years or so. And he, you know, uh, will ultimately create new pathways for understanding literary criticism and history or Christian apologetics or uh, Narnia and the way that we understand how fantasy literature should work. He, really important that way, but he's not there yet. These are just two gentlemen scholars sitting around in the 1930s wishing there were more books around that they liked to read. And they liked what they called romance or adventure stories in a kind of a classical vein but updated in a certain kind of way. So they decided to write their own. They flipped a coin. You know, heads gets space travel, tails gets time travel perhaps and it was Tolkien that got time travel and he went and he worked on it uh, it was called Lost Road it was like an Atlantean kind of a time travel piece which he never finished and which wasn't the part we have wasn't published for a long time after but Lewis actually did go and set to work he was tasked with making a space travel book and he did it he went to work and he wrote a space travel book and that's what we get in Out of the Silent Planet uh, C.S. Lewis wrote a letter of recommendation for it. It was rejected from a first publisher, but ca grabbed by a second. It was reviewed pretty widely. There was at least 60 reviews in the first five years in major magazines. and But of those, most people didn't get that there was any kind of a spiritual element to it. For those that had eyes to see and ears to hear, however, they did catch a kind of spiritual or theological element that sit sat within the text uh, and within its layers that then they began to understand Lewis in a new light. So it wasn't a surprise for them when he became the author of the book that made him famous, The Screwtape Letters, which was a theological novella, advice from a senior demon to a junior demon on spiritual life. Well, how do we read Out of the Silent Planet today? Well, I think the best thing to do before you think about it as a work of C.S. Lewis or theological fiction, you know, or World War II era fiction or anything like that, I think the best thing to do is just pick it up and read it as classic sci-fi because it reads that way. C.S. Lewis is definitely writing in the vein of H.G. Wells. There were other fantastic authors that he admired at the time, particularly The Room, Worm Ouroboros by uh, Edison, David Lindsay's A Voyage to Arcturus, Charles Williams' uh, Place of the Lion, and some of his other uh, fantastic or supernatural fiction was kicking around at the time. And he probably read some of the dystopias, like Huxley's Brave New World would have been out by this point. But 
Sci-fi was still trying to find its way, and really the biggest person at the time that was writing, had been writing sci-fi, was H.G. Wells. And we know the story of oh, The War of the Worlds. It's a story about Martians coming to attack on Earth. But we may not know the story of The First Men on the Moon by H.G. Wells, which was uh, written kind of in the same period at the, you know, H.G. Wells doing his writing at the end of the 19th century, at the beginning of the 20th century. He's forging this kind of sci-fi way that's a little different than Jules Verne um, in his own vein, but not terribly different. But First Men on the Moon is uh, the trip of a couple of gentlemen that go to the surface of the moon and encounter the creatures that are there. Well, important books at the time, C.S. Lewis wants to retell the story, and he does it by turning everything upside down. Instead of having Martians, evil Martians, coming here and, you know, you know, tackling everybody at, at, on Earth, and then humans win in the end, or having humans go to Mars and, you know, kill everybody, and humans win in the end, Lewis wants to turn it upside down. He has a couple of bad guys, a scientist, and just really a a, a, a greedy bureaucrat, basically a scholar, but a greedy bureaucrat. They get together. They kidnap our main character, Doctor Elwin Ransom. Uh, Ransom is a philologist, somebody who studies words, teaches at Cambridge, and he's just basically walking in the countryside, so nobody knows where he is. He's got no accountability. They kidnap him in a spherical spaceship, and they they zoom him off to the planet called Malacandra. Malacandra. We know it's Mars, but but C.S. Uh, C.S. Lewis's main character Ransom doesn't know for a while that it's Mars. Uh, they get there. They intend to offer basically Doctor Ransom as a sacrifice to the to the um, people that live on Malacandra, uh, having misunderstood what they were supposed to do. They're there just to basically um, harvest gold and other precious metals and ultimately to colonize the planet and take over the planet. Um, what they don't understand when they get there is that there's some peculiarities about the planet. There's not one kind of sentient being like humans on Earth, but actually three kinds that have quite different physiology but can share speech and uh, they can live together in trade and peace. Uh, they are not technologically advanced. For the most part, they live as sort of Stone Age people, but they have access to technology. They just choose not to use it. They can do things uh, that are Space Age techniques. They just simply choose not to do them because they're not, pro they're not worthwhile to them. And there are people that largely live on peace in peace. Dr. Ransom is able to escape his captors and flee into the wilderness and begins to live with one of these local tribes. And instead of so many stories that you see from Europe where a white guy comes and helps the locals, the natives, uh, I don't know, find some way or fight off some foe or something, Ransom simply goes there and learns and discovers that he's embarrassed to be human that these so-called savages or aliens, you know, the, the people that have been scary in his mind, are actually people that live this rich, deep, um, cultivated, integrated life. Everything's upside down. But, of course, the bad guys catch up to him, and there's crisis, and then there's got to be a resolution of the crisis. And the last half of the novel is Ransom uh, going on a pilgrimage, a journey to try and make good for the death of, the, of uh, his best friend, Malachandra. Now, this is a philosophical novel. There's debates in it and arguments. The, the characters are a bit stodgy. Uh, they're a bit overdrawn. Um, they're, they're not all totally life uh, realized as we get in some of uh, Lewis's later work. And so you have to forgive him for this. This is almost, he, he doesn't really know the genre yet. He's real, really still writing an Arthurian type story or like a fairy tale, but doing it in space. And so he's got, Lewis has some work to do on this. But it is interesting the way that Lewis turns everything upside down. He takes the values of H.G. Wells, who was a, an important atheist of his period uh, and had a certain understanding of what it meant to be human and how to read human history, and he turns those upside down and reinterprets them. And in doing so, he actually gives us a really kind of subtle critique on colonialism and how empire building works. This is this is actually one of the fruitful things that come out of one of C.S. Lewis's more obscure books, Out of the Silent Planet.
Now, it's best read in concert with First Men in the Moon, which uh, it, it's very much a response to that, but also I would encourage H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. We finish the book and discover that the book itself, this book here, isn't actually fiction. It's actually a real story that happened, and there's like a secret international, interglobal fight that's going on that you're invited to be involved in and that carries on in books like Paralandra and in my scholarship I've argued that it also carries on in a book like The Screwtape Letters, also a found narrative. Well, that's what I'm going to give you of Out of the Silent Planet. I hope it convinces you to read it. As always, I encourage you to subscribe here on my YouTube channel. Check out my Twitter account at Brent and Dana and follow me on Instagram if you can. I will follow back. And always check out my website at pilgrimandnarnia.com. And until then, this has been my 10-minute talk on Out of the Silent Planet.